We are in our Bibles this morning in Matthew chapter 6, as uh, Josh already read for us. <clears throat> Thankful for the opportunity to uh, preach this morning. You're probably wondering if pastor's here, um, what is Caleb doing up there? <laughs> and um, uh, a pastor got in, of course, uh, this last, last night, and there was some concern over, you know, flights making it, and so... I got the the call up from the minor leagues, so appreciate that opportunity. And we were talking about, I think this might only be the second or third time I preached when he's here. So um, normally I can say anything I want, and at least he's not here to, no, I'm just kidding, but um, I, I appreciate that. And we're looking in God's word this morning. Uh, we just saying that uh, him for me to live is Christ. And my uh, wife uh, picked that. And uh, boy, that's a song that is much easier to sing than it is uh, perhaps to be honest about. Um, of course, it's quoting um, the words of the Apostle Paul who said, For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But for uh, much of our lives, perhaps for myself at least, um, for me to live is often something other than Christ. It's um, the other things that I'm wrapped up in and excited about and the other things I find a joy in and, and fulfillment in and uh, anything other than Christ that, that really um, is the thing that we're living for is the wrong thing. Um, there's so much that we have as responsibilities that God has given us, but all of it is to be done uh, in the spirit of serving Christ, isn't it? And as we look at today's text, um, I would like us to be to be mindful of that. That uh, really is is what this is about. the The message this morning is titled uh, "Daily Decisions." Christ, um, in the text that Josh read uh, just a moment ago, in uh, Matthew chapter six, is in the middle of uh, the Sermon on the Mount. And I want to just point out a couple things before we really get into this message. And I don't know. I'm sure you noticed as Josh was reading, but I highlighted in my Bible. Uh, there's a phrase there that was repeated over and over again. Did you notice that as we were looking? Um, I don't know. You, you can almost not read it without it really jumping out at us. But I highlighted in, in uh, my Bible, verse 25 says, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought. Verse 27 says, Which of you by taking thought? And verse 28 says, And why take ye thought? Uh, beginning of verse 31, Therefore take no thought. Verse 34, take therefore no thought, for the, mor the morrow shall take thought. So there's, uh, Christ is emphasized there, obviously, a, a concept about what we're worried about and what we spend our time with our mind uh, thinking about. And there are so many things that uh, cause us worry. Some of us are worriers, right? How many of you are worriers? I tend to be less of a worrier, generally. Um, that might I think that it bothers some people, possibly my wife sometimes, maybe maybe others, and you know it seems like well don't you don't you even care? It's like, well, you know, and some of those are you know flaws in my character let's let's be honest here, okay, but I tend not to be a war a worrier, but my mind, like anybody else, is often taken up, my thoughts are taken up with things that are of much smaller significance compared to the things of the Lord and what Christ would have me give my time and attention to. Of course, in verse 33 says, but seek ye first. Uh, the first thing in our, in our mind and our thoughts is to be the kingdom of God. But I want to look at this thought of daily decisions. Uh, Christ looks at his followers <clears throat> and verse number 24 there, and we'll look at it again. He says, no man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Christ looks at, at his followers here in the middle of this message and informs them really that they're going to have to make a choice, a decision, if you will, between God and mammon. Now, when we read that word mammon, for some of you, it may um, look like some kind of a foreign language. 
For others, we've heard it before and are, are kind of know what it's about. And usually the first thing that we think about is is money, is is uh, wealth and, and those types of things. And, and that is the, the primary thing there. But really, I believe it represents to us all the things of this world. Uh, money is the, the primary one, but so many other things that are involved in all that is temporal and temporary in our life. Let's be honest, much that takes up our time on a daily basis are things that are temporary in, in their duration. And Christ says, you're going to have to make decisions about what you're going to serve. They cannot follow after both at the same time. Scripture is replete with these calls to decide, to choose. You may remember that one of the first things we see in the scripture is, is really an opportunity for Adam and Eve to choose. Is it not? To choose between God and the knowledge of good and evil. As we go on through scripture, we find other choices. We Find Joshua speaking in a verse that we're perhaps familiar with, Joshua 24, 15, which says, Choose you this day whom you will serve. Right now, choose. Who's it going to be? Are you going to serve God or are you going to serve uh, the idols that your father served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt? Choose today, Joshua said. Elijah, you may remember in his famous confrontation on Mount Carmel, addressed the Israelites of the northern kingdom. And he says, how long are you going to halt between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. If Baal, then follow him. Choose, pick, pick a side. Christ said in various places, uh, similar things. Uh, one man was going to follow him and he said, if you want to follow me, it's going to be uncomfortable. Uh, the animals and uh, the birds, they have a place to sleep, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. Another man, he said, follow me. And he says, well, I need to go handle some things first. And he says, no, you can't go back if you're going to follow me. No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. To the rich young ruler, You'll remember that he gave him a choice. The young man said he'd done all the law from his youth upward. And Christ said, great. Go sell everything that you have and give it to the poor and come and follow me. Choose. What's it going to be? Are you going to serve your wealth? Are you going to serve mammon? Or are you willing to follow and serve me? Christ said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross daily and follow me. If you're not willing to forsake everything and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. Luke 14, 33, Christ said that. In the book of James, we find friendship with the world is enmity with God. We have to choose. We must choose who we want as our friend, who we are willing to have as our enemy, excuse me, to be friends with the, Lord, the world and be the enemy of God or to be the friend of God and be the enemy of the world. It's all about choices. It's all about decisions. I title this message Daily Decisions because I realized that the decision to be a disciple of Christ is not one which is made at a point in time and then never revisited. But it is a series of daily decisions. Daily decisions to deny self, to take up the cross and follow Christ. I cannot serve myself and serve Christ simultaneously. I will, as Christ said, I will either hate Christ and love myself, or else I will hold to Christ and despise myself. I cannot serve both the temporal, and the eternal. These thoughts 
they apply in so many uh, areas of life. We think about, as Christ said here, seeking first the kingdom of God. And that affects everything that we do. Sometimes we think of these things in, in nebulous terms of what does it really mean to follow Christ? And I'm reminded that there are so many practical areas of following Christ. It affects the way that I treat my wife. It affects um, the way that I, I care about her, the way that I uh, seek to, to see that her needs are met and that she's cared for physically and emotionally and uh, mentally and, and all of those things. It affects the way I uh, relate to my children and whether I'm seeking to, to teach them and to set an example for them of, of following the Lord and of loving the Lord. It affects uh, how I relate to those that uh, I work with or perhaps those that you may uh, have employed for you. It, it affects all of the relationships of life. It's not a nebulous thing about uh, following Christ and, uh, and not going after and serving the things of this world. It is practical. Who are we serving today? Who am I serving? The decisions that we make about how we utilize our time, how we utilize our energy, our money, and our possessions will often tell the true story of who or what we are serving. Oftentimes it is true that, that we do well serving God in some areas, but not in others. Maybe we do well serving Christ with, with money and, and possessions and we're, we're willing to give those things, but our time uh, and energy are things that we hold on to. Maybe giving time and energy is easy, but it is our money and possessions that we're holding on to too tightly. Perhaps our service to Christ is almost non-existent in our lives and it's just a, a Sunday morning thing that we do. But the call of Christ comes to you and it comes to me as it did really to his first disciples. Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. We look at that, that call that Christ gave and it had a dramatic effect on the lives of those who heard it. Peter, James, and John forsook all and followed Christ. They walked away from their nets and they followed Christ. Am I willing to turn from all else to pursue Christ? What have I denied myself for Christ? If I spend my time and energy and resources indulging myself and ignoring my responsibilities to the Lord and my love for Christ, then the answer is likely that I have denied myself very little for Christ. You know, I thought, we all deny ourselves some things, don't we? Maybe I've denied myself <laughs> some of my, my worst desires, but in many cases, no different than a person who doesn't know Christ at all. You know, we don't have to know, we don't have to be a Christian in order to know that it is, not in our uh, best interest to uh, lose our temper and you know punch somebody in the face who's made us upset, right? Most of us have felt uh, that uh, desire at some point in time. I heard somebody put it this way: you know, you just want to give somebody a high five right to the face, you know. And uh, right? Do we have that impulse? I think we all have impulses like that. But why don't we do it? Well, we don't do it because we know it's in our you know best interest not not to be. Uh, taking a court over assault and those types of things, right? And so we hold back because of our own best interests, all right? We, we do withhold ourselves from a lot of things that would be sinful in our lives because we know if we indulge in those things, it's going to hurt us. But the call to deny ourselves to follow Christ goes far beyond what just is in our own best interest, doesn't it? When, uh, again, when Peter, James, and John left their nets, Boy, from a worldly perspective, that wasn't in their best interest, was it? This wasn't something that a person would, would generally do, thinking, this is going to really benefit me in the long term. But they had to deny themselves 
to follow Christ? What have we denied ourselves to follow Christ? Have we chosen to forgo a little extra comfort, perhaps, to support the work of God with our tithes and offerings? Have we considered a potential change in employment in light of how it might affect our spiritual lives, our spiritual well-being? Are we, are we clutching at and holding tight to our unrighteous mammon, as Christ calls it in another place? Are we holding it tight to our hearts and pleading with Christ not to ask us to let it go? Those of, there's a, a, some here who are in our parables class, and we have a parable coming up in a few weeks that is going to be um, about the unjust steward. Some of you might know the story. Uh, this man was a, a, a steward for a, a wealthy man, and he was, the Bible says he was an unjust steward. So uh, he'd apparently been involved in some sort of, of fraud or um, embezzlement, perhaps, of his master's wealth. And the story goes that the man comes to his steward and says, you're going to have to give an account. I've heard about what's been going on. And the steward goes to some of the, his Lord's creditors, and he discounts what they owe. He says, hey, how much, how much do you owe my master? Well, I owe so much. Well, mark it down to this amount. And then he goes to two of his other creditors and, and does the same thing. He says, that's how much? You, okay, well, mark it down to a lesser amount. And his plan was that when he lost his job, which was inevitably going to happen when the accounts were audited, that these men who now owed him something would receive them into his house. He says, um, I'm too too soft, if you will, perhaps, to, to, to go about begging or working a manual labor type of job. I've got to make a plan so that I'm not going to have to stoop to that when I get put out of the stewardship. And Christ uses this as an example and says to His disciples to make friends of the mammon of unrighteousness that when ye fail, ye may be received into eternal habitations. Here's, here's the, what He's saying to him, to them, excuse me. Said, you just said not to make friends of, of the world, right? He's saying, use the possessions that I have placed in your hands to make friends in eternity. To, give, uh, to yield eternal benefits in heaven. Why has God placed things in our hands that we have? It certainly isn't for us to set our heart upon them, uh, to spend our lives worrying about what more we can get and how we can hold on to what we have but it is so that we can make use of what He has placed in our hands for the advancement of Christ's eternal kingdom. The mistake that we make is when we begin clutching at those things and holding on to them tightly to the detriment of the kingdom of God. Christ calls me to start each day saying, here's my heart. O oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. We sing a hymn around here that says, Set my heart, O dear Father, and thee, and thee only. Here's my life, Lord. Here are my ambitions. Here is my desire for comfort and ease, for power and wealth, for beautiful houses, fancy cars, beautiful clothes, expensive jewelry. Here's my desire for the assurance of financial security and physical safety, perhaps. None of these things will be permitted to dominate my thoughts or drive my activities. As another song says, all the vain things, all the empty temporary things that charm me most, I sacrifice them to His blood. We need to say that our desire is that our hearts would be fixed on Christ. You cannot serve God in mammon. We cannot have a heart that is set on all that this world can offer and also have it set on Christ and follow Him. There's a battle going on in our world over freedoms and who has them, right? That's in the news, it seems like, all the time. What, what liberties we should or should not have. Should we have the, the liberty to go around without wearing masks or to be vaccinated or unvaccinated? Should other people be allowed to be maskless or vaccinated or unvaccinated? There's a lot of discussion going on about that. What liberties we have and we don't have. 
And in our Christian life, we become so fixated on our rights and Christian liberties that oftentimes we forget that Christ has called us to live with our bodies presented to Him as a living sacrifice. My life as a Christian is not about my rights and liberties ultimately. If I am a sacrifice, if I am a, a living sacrifice to God, if I belong to Him, then I have no ambition except for His ambition. No desire but His desire. No concern but His concern. No right but the right to obey His will. No possessions but His possessions. No time but His time. No energy but what I owe to Him. Have we surrendered our hearts to Him? You know, we could be, we could be legalists as the Pharisees were. We could judge everyone based upon a series of Christian performance metrics, right? If you're into sports, you know that that's one of the things, you know, different performance metrics. And a baseball has gone crazy with, you know, spin rates on pitches and so many other things, launch angles, and they've got all kinds of metrics that they use, and really that spans uh, much of the sports that we consume. And so we could go around to each Christian and we could, you know, line them up next to the performance metrics to see where they land, and that you know, might somewhat simplify the Christian life, right? And some people, uh, as the Pharisees in Christ's day, would achieve very high scores based upon those measures. Those who tithe and serve and attend and participate would be given very high marks as Christians. But our Lord measured things differently. The Pharisees received a failing grade in His assessment, did they not? And God would measure us by our hearts. Our pastor's been emphasizing for a while the idea of loving God and loving others. Christ said the two great commandments, right? We're to love the Lord with all of our heart and to love our neighbor as ourselves. If Christ was to measure us, it wouldn't be by those outward performance metrics, but by our hearts, by our love for God and our love for our neighbor, our fellow man, if you will. These are heart issues. And God looks on the heart. Yes, a heart that loves God, loves His church, does it not? It it loves to serve, it loves to give, it loves to attend, it loves to participate, right? Those are results of a love of Christ. But a, love, a heart that loves God goes far beyond mere outward expressions because it knows that none of these things is enough. None of those outward things is enough. Isaac Watts put it well when he wrote, Love so amazing, so divine, demands all of my outward performance things. Demands my soul, my life, my all. The disciples whom Christ called got it, didn't they? When we look at their lives, they denied themselves the comforts of an easy life. They took a path that ran against the grain of culture and popular religion of their day, but they didn't do it just to be difficult or to be contrary, to stick it in someone's face, or because they like to shout at people or feel superior about about the choices they had made, but they did it because of the love of Christ which compelled them to follow Him. The pursuit of Christ led them in the opposite direction of those who are rejecting Christ. The world is stumbling through the darkness of this world, chasing the illusion of satisfaction which they believe can be found in self-indulgence. In truth, they're running headlong off a cliff. The follower of Christ is running a race of self-denial, pressing forward with his eyes fixed on the blessed hope and glorious appearing of Christ. He's cutting through the tide of people that are all traveling in the other direction. And as he pushes through following Christ, he is looking for opportunities to turn others on the path of following Christ as well. The path of discipleship, pleading and warning of coming judgment and uh, the availability of pardon in Christ. He doesn't care what it costs him to oppose the culture. He doesn't care that it makes him stand out. He doesn't mind if he travels alone. He does not account for any of these losses because he knows that he is following in the steps of his Savior. And his heart thrills with each step and counts all earthly gain as worthlessness. 
He counts it as an infinitely cheap price to pay for the superiority of Christ. Isn't that what, what Paul said? He said, in my past life, I had all of these things that I thought were so worthwhile. Well, I was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. I was a Pharisee. Touching the law, I was blameless. He says, but now that I have Christ, I count all those things as less than worthless. When we arise each moment, we are, each morning, we are met with a host of decisions that we will have to face throughout the day. But the greatest decision is, will we give Christ our heart today? Or will our heart be enamored with and captured by this world? As kids, we sang that song, This world is not my home, I'm just a passing through, my treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue, right? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. But the reality is, we usually feel far more at home in this world than we do with the thought of heaven. So often we need to, we ought to be praying to the Lord to give us the grace to set our affections on things above. I want to encourage uh, each of us. The path following Christ is going to seem strange to others. It may seem painful, it may seem difficult to go through life living a, something that is so foreign to, to family sometimes, to uh, friends and to associates, but is it worthwhile to do so? Is it worthwhile to serve God instead of mammon? In Matthew 19, the disciples watched a rich man turn away from Christ so that he could save his earthly life and wealth. Christ said, sell all, give it to the poor and follow me. And He said, I'm not willing to do that. I want to save my life. He wanted to save his mammon. He wanted to serve his mammon, if you will. And in verse 27 of Matthew 19, Peter asks a question which must have been on all of their minds. He says, Lord, behold, we have forsaken all. He wasn't willing to, but we did. We've forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? Could sum up the question this way. Is it going to be worth it, Christ? Lord, is it going to be worth it in the end? You asked us to leave behind a lucrative fishing business. I assume it was a lucrative. Maybe it wasn't. To become your disciples, and unlike this man, we did it. We left it behind. We forsook all to follow you. Is it going to be worth it? We could have been comfortable and happy in our former lives. Is our choice going to be worthwhile? Is that not the question of our hearts so often? Say, Lord, you've called me to forsake the comforts of this world to follow you, but I wonder if it's worth it. Christ responded, whatever you have left behind will be repaid 100 fold and you will have an uh, everlasting life. Will that make it worthwhile for you, Peter? Is that enough? Don't you believe that you can trust me with your life? See, this is where my heart balks at the call of Christ. If I give up what I want for what he wants, will it be worth it? Can I trust Him to do what's best for me? Will He let me down? Is it going to work out to forsake what I can see and touch for those things that I cannot see or touch? Is it worthwhile to exchange the temporal for the eternal, to trade pl present pleasure for everlasting blessedness? In our text this morning, Christ says, don't worry. Take no thought for the disposable things of this life, the things that rust and break down and wear out. Don't worry about those things. I will see to it that your needs are met without the need for you to waste all of your energy and emotion worrying about them. And when you enter into my presence, you will find that it costs you nothing of real value and gained you the, bless the blessings of immeasurable value. It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. We sing that, but often we don't believe it. What is holding you back from deciding to forsake all and follow Christ? Christ asks us the question, will you hate me and love the world? Or will you hold to Christ and despise the things of this world? Who are you going to serve? Lord, I pray that you will apply the truths of your word to our hearts. 
that we would consider each day and each moment about what should hold our hearts. Would you give us the grace to have our affections set on you and what you desire to do in our lives? In Jesus' name, amen. You know, the gospel and the way it's presented and how it's received, when you understand what the gospel is, it's forgiveness. It's saying whatever you've done in your past, I remember no more. It's allowing us to come to the point in our lives where there's nothing to precious to possess that we're not willing to give away. You can't manufacture that. You can't make it up. You can't pound the pulpit. You can't say, don't do this. Don't do that. It comes out of a heart. And our dear brother just speaked on that. It's like this. I heard this illustration this week, and this is the message after the message. It's hard to have somebody else to preach and not get to preach yourself, but we're just the waiter. The gospel comes from God. And we deliver the gospel to others. We're just the waiter. And sometimes I heard, have you ever been in a restaurant where everything's great, the meal, the restaurant's good, the presentation's good, but the food stinks? Nobody wants to eat that stuff. Kurt Skelly said there was a place down in Luzerne County, Pennsylvania somewhere where he went up there and the restaurant was kind of dilapidated. The people maybe weren't very well kept. He says, but the restaurant was packed. You know why? Because what they were giving was worth it all. And I want to tell you, that's what our dear brother just preached about. It's not what you give up. It's what can I give him? That's what we're talking about. What a great message. Man, did I convict me. Let's all stand together. And if you're, I would like to come and pray this. Uh, uh, let's all stand, please. Iris is, yeah, there she is. He's going to play. And here's the invitation. If you're not sure if you're saved, why don't you come and do this altar? And we'll have somebody speak to you about what it means to be a Christian. But just maybe, just maybe on this second Sunday in February you love the Lord the gospel is so good and maybe God's talking to you about when some areas of your life that you need to surrender to him whatever it is let's let's do right now as our praise team comes and sings right now let's do that right now God bless you folks